of ministry. There's people that are in Washington, D.C., serving high-ranking high leaders in Washington, D.C. that graduated from BRSM. Daniel Kalinda is a graduate of BRSM. Sammy Rodriguez was powerfully touched. Jim Rayley was powerfully touched at Brownsville. Kevin Wallace, where I was just up there on Friday night, powerfully touched. His wife, his wife was powerfully touched at Brownsville. Her name is Devin, his name is Kevin. And she was powerfully touched at Brownsville when she was 16, and now she's a pastor's wife, and their church is booming in Chattanooga. There's leaders from all over the world that's now in the ministry and on the mission field and pastoring churches and evangelists that was powerfully touched at Brownsville. Nathan Morris. So many. Derek Prince was touched by the Brownsville Revival. So when revival was over as we knew it, it was a time that I look back on and it was very, very difficult to push ahead knowing that I didn't have that revival anymore. I called it, I had to land the shuttle. On Father's Day, it blasted off into outer space, but my job was, because we couldn't go any longer, we just couldn't do it, was to land the shuttle to bring it back down in Earth's atmosphere. I had made to make sure that all the heat tiles was underneath it. And so when we was coming back and we went through all the turbulence of bringing this thing down and landing the shuttle, when me and Steve stepped off the shuttle, we were still the best of friends. It was a revival that was successful. It touched the world. And we never had a crossword. We never got off and didn't speak to one another and that kind of thing. We were still best of friends. So I look back on it, and I have so many memories. I look at revivals like we see now at Asbury, and, man, I'm totally behind it. I know that president probably had a gut-wrenching decision to think about changing the order of things. And so I put myself in his place, and I say, he knows things I don't know. He's in a position I'm not in. I'm not going to criticize that whatsoever. But I believe that when a man's put in that position, the Lord will give him wisdom. But there's a reason why God keeps visiting Asbury. And so I just pray he keeps visiting John Kilpatrick, Church of His Presence. Amen. Amen. So we got a few minutes. Lyndall, where are you at? Would you come up and join me? I need a couple more chairs, guys. Uh, Brenda, why don't you come up and join me, honey? We're just going to take a few minutes. Do you all mind if we take a few more minutes? She's not getting old. She's under the glory. <laughs> I need another chair over here. I need a chair for, for Lendl. We have it. There we go. Yeah. Come on over, Lendl. Well, Lendl, you heard what I just got through talking about. Right there. I want you to pitch in, jump in, and give us your two cents worth. What are you thinking about this? Uh, well, I just, I'm, I'm never, I never cease to be amazed at the Pharisees in the church that want to brand everything. They want to brand it revival. This is revival. That's not revival. This is revival. That's not revival. God can use you. He can't use you. It's just silly. I mean, for heaven's sake, bro, <coughs> let it get born. Let the thing be born, yeah. and then we'll call it whatever it winds up being. You know, if it's awakening, a revival, why do we need a title, and why do we need to just put our mouth on everything? Why can't we just say, God, do something? I mean, we, we, we were in this meeting at Kevin's church in Chattanooga, and yesterday, I'm a little tired today. Whew. I have high glory tolerance, but I'm telling you, yesterday... Uh, Yesterday, we started the service at 10 o'clock. 
with 2,500 teenagers, Generation Z. And uh, I was supposed to speak. And uh, he was supposed to speak Friday, and he left and didn't do it. I couldn't. I couldn't. There's no way. The glory came, and it was just crazy. Yeah. Well, they just went crazy for the first hour or so. Then they start, turned the service to me, and I sat down with the kids, and I said, Look, I want to speak to you as a father in the faith, and I want to tell you this. When this emotion wears off, your, your love for Jesus has to hit a bedrock of something that you have an affection for him that's greater than the experience. It's got to happen. You've got to hit bedrock where you love God and you're not backing down from what God has done. Yeah. And I took them through the scriptures and I began to talk about the love affair God has had with Israel and how on every hand he was rejected. Mm -hmm. constantly rejected to the point that he retreats from the fire by day and the a fire by night cloud by day and he begins to hide his his presence the glory of the lord would come on moses when he'd come out of the tent and they'd say go cover your face moses matter of fact move the tent outside mm -hmm. outside the camp because we don't want to see just tell us what god says we don't want his glory and I, and i said uh, to the point that you, that god starts speaking through prophets and then we sawed them in half and got rid of them because we didn't want to hear what they had to say because they were pleading on the behalf of a heartbroken father. Our Heavenly Father's heart was broken over his children's rejection of him. And I began to talk to the kids about that. Then I took them to the book of Hosea. And I said, look what God asks Hosea to do. He asked him to marry a woman of ill repute that would never be faithful to him. And he was instructed that every time she's unfaithful, you take her back. You do it every time. And you show these people what they've done to my heart. And I looked at those kids and I said, let me ask you a question, kids. I mean, you just want to come up here and get something from God. You want to get off a of pot. You want to get off of cocaine or crack or, or your addiction to porn or whatever it is. You want something from God. But I got a question for you. When are you going to give something to him? When are you... When are you going to love on him for all the rejection he's had? And I'm telling you, that spirit of glory and hunger got a hold of them. And altars filled. The spirit of God blew up. We left at four in the afternoon. And Amber kept saying, she's, she's Sister Holy Ghost. She goes, we got to drive. We've got to go down to Daphne. We've got to go. And I said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I have sat through COVID. I've sat through post-Brownsville. And by George, if the glory's coming, I'm sitting right here. Yeah. I don't care how late we have to yeah. drive. Yeah. That's right. yeah. And uh, I think God is up to something. I don't know what to call it yet, but I'm seeing it break out everywhere. I concern myself for us that we don't sleep through it. And we don't go, well, maybe I don't want that or maybe I do. I don't know about you, but I'm beside myself. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm sick of life and sick of houses. I'm sick of all of it. I'm sick of church. I'm sick. The only thing I'm not sick of is Amber. <laughs> and my boys on certain days, I'm sick of them. But I'm just telling you <laughs> that there is nothing I want more than to be in the presence of God. And as I, as I sat there in those meetings yesterday and Friday night, I kept looking up to the, friend, I looked up to the heavens and I looked at the still and I said, oh, I love this, Daddy. I love this. Can I just live here? Do I have to go home? I've lost love for my home. I don't even want to go home. I just want to be in his presence. And, and that's, that's, I don't know what you want me to say, but that's, that's the mess I'm in right now. <laughs> When you talk about the presence, that's what it's all about. It changes you. And I know when I went to Toronto, and I've told you part of the story, but when I went, I was so touched, so changed, and I had four months in my home with an encounter with the Lord every day. Four hours I would sit and just weep before him. And I fell in love with Jesus. Yeah all over. I loved him. I gave my best to him. 
I think I did, reading his word every morning. That was a ritual with me, and I would pray. I'd do what I knew and wanted to do. I love the word, but when I fell in love with him, I didn't know you could have that kind of love. You girls are looking for love. He can satisfy every longing. And so many people say, oh, I love the Lord. I love him. But are you in love with him? There's a big difference. Men, you love your wife. You respect your wife. But are you in love with your wife? There's a big difference. And one of the things that I've noticed that when I came back and then revival broke out, and it wasn't about me. I'm just saying that was my testimony. That when I did come back, four months later, Holy Spirit came to Brownsville. But you see, that's what it's all about to me, is knowing Him, getting in His presence, having that breakthrough for yourself, and be a carrier of His glory. Then, look at all the people that came to the Brownsville Revival. Not because of me, but because I went to Toronto. Father's love was there. Father's love touched me. Came all the way down from Canada to Pensacola, Florida. I'm a carrier, and I want more. I am not satisfied. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Well, I guess the biggest issue is how do you prepare yourself for more? Well, you can't have more if you've got it all now. You can't put another stick of furniture in your room if your house is full. You got to start moving some stuff around and making room. One of the things that I find that we learned in, in revival was... We all grew up Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Spirit-filled church. And sometimes you can create a machine where this is what you do, and this is what you do next, and this is what it is, and this is what's next. But I'm telling you, when the Heavenly Father visits a people, he, un he dismantles the machine. And I remember, I remember this, and I feel like this is what God's about to do right now. Literally... I came with my bag of tricks from Nashville to Pensacola, and I said, I know how to do a choir, and I know how to do orchestrations, and I know how to do all this. And I came in there with that paradigm that I was going to do that because that's what I'd been known for. That's what I'd done. I was an accomplished musician. I knew how to play real chords and real charts. And, and guess what the Lord did? He said, I don't want to use any of that in this revival. And I said, okay, great. Now, so basically, I've wasted a whole lifetime of learning how to play chords, and you don't want that. And we started playing three chord songs with no fancy chords and no passing anything, and it sounded terrible, and, and none of it was rehearsed, and it was just awful. And it was embarrassing musically to me. But what I learned is God didn't need my machine Yeah. He, revival brings something fresh and new. Every revival has its distinctives. It has a preacher. It has the word. It has a sound. And that's why I'm saying that, that it's the hardest for Pentecostals. Because one of the things we learned, Pastor, was about the glory. And, and I try to tell Pentecostals this now. And they still can't hear me. I remember a prophetess of the Lord, a real woman of God, walked up into our meetings, and she was full-on old school. She, had, she looked like she's dressed like a nurse. She had the nurse shoes and the support hose and the long dress and the little bun, and, and she knew the glory. It just shone on her face. The glory of God just on her. And she'd get up and say something, the glory of the Lord just come. And I'm over here working myself to death to get the glory to come. And she's over here just flowing in it. And, like, and, and she sang awful. And looked, it's just, I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> and she walked up to me one night. And I'll, it changed my I don't know if I ever told you this. She walked up to me and tapped on my keyboard. And she said, sweetheart, said, you carry the glory. You don't have to work for it. 
And she said, the biggest problem you have is your talent. She said, when he comes, get out of the way. That's true. And I remember Pastor John would look at me sometimes in the early, early days of revival. And I'd try to get on that keyboard or sing and he'd go. And we learned that the father, the heavenly father, the bridegroom wants to hear from the bride. And when we take your voice as worship leaders, we take the sound of the bride from the bridegroom's ear. He don't want to hear us. He wants to hear you. We really should not be called worship leaders. We should be called worship starters. We start it. You should finish it. And there's something in the sound of glory when it comes from your voice. When your spirit starts finding its way to your vocal cords, that's why all the time at Church of His Presence, you'll hear pastor go, lift your voice. What is he trying to do? See if the glory is going to settle on it. Because what happens when your voice starts lifting, it's not just a a chant. No, no, no. We're looking for the angels of the Lord to about six inches from your face to grab that sound and fling it into the heavens. And the heavenly hosts begin to join in. And there's a shine that comes over it and it's otherworldly it doesn't sound like humans and it's in, and, and demons leave one night we were singing and a, a Filipino pastor's daughter who had been in witchcraft her and her sister came her sister got out of witchcraft she was in witchcraft and the spirit of God came in like that as we began to worship the Lord and the glory I feel the glory now the glory of the Lord started coming And that demon in her screamed without being cast out. It screamed and a leopard came out of her mouth and walked and ran out the door because it could not stay in the glory. It could not stay in the glory. So why do we want the glory? Because when the glory comes, everything leaves. Your weariness leaves. Your scared fear, the attacks of the enemy, physical illnesses, when the angels of the Lord, unforgiveness, sin, you suddenly got to get it out. If you've been lying on somebody, you got to go straighten it out. That's what the glory of the Lord does. It's what the glory of the Lord does. And I'm just insatiably hungry for it. And uh, I told the Lord, don't. I, if you're not going to let me see another move, you should have just taken me on to heaven 16 That's weeks right. ago. That's right. But I'm back here, and by George, we're going to have a revival. Because I'm hungry. Are you hungry? Yeah. Come on, lift up your voice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You might be seated. I'm going to uh, just close out, take about five minutes and close out. I'll let you go in about five minutes. But let me just say this. Oh. Hey, I think all of us, those of you watching and those of us here, I think all of us are saying that we want God to move, don't we? Yes. How many of you want that? Yes. Okay, now, one thing I want you to understand is this. Oh. You can't schedule it. And I can't get up here behind the pulpit and say, Hey, next Sunday be here, revival's coming. I can't do that. You need to always be here in case revival breaks out. Suppose I hadn't have been there on Father's Day of 95 when it broke out at my church. You almost didn't go. I know, I almost did. But the Lord fixed it where I was there. So you don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. But also you're going to have to get out of this thing too. <clears throat> oh my goodness, it's happening over there, but it's not happening in our church. Listen, God will send revival in his time. You can't make God do anything. Do y'all understand that? And I can't sit here tonight and tell you that, that this is going to happen, that's going to happen, but I know you're hungry. I'm hungry. And I, I know that God's about to do great things. But here's what I want to end up by telling you. I don't believe revival is going to last long. Let me tell you why. Because I believe Jesus is about to come. I believe believe Jesus Jesus is about to come. And I don't say that in a a way of a cliche. I say it because I really, really, truly am convicted about it. I mean it. When you look around 
And I just want you to ask you to examine yourself for a minute. I just want you to examine yourself just for a minute. But when you look around and you see that right now revival has broken out, you can criticize it. You can say it's not God. I don't care what you say. I believe God's moving, and I believe it. I believe it's of God. The Euphrates River is drying up, just like the Bible said would happen. And the kings of the east, which is China, there's China's in the news every day now. The kings of the east will march up the dried up Euphrates River, and they'll work their way all the way down, being led by three unclean spirits like frogs that will lead the kings of the east all the way down into the Valley of Megiddo for the Battle of Armageddon. So already the Euphrates River is drying up. It's almost totally dried up right now. Iran right now is undergoing a major upheaval. And they're saying, we're tired of the Ayatollahs. We're tired of this. We want a different Iran. We're going to rise up and we're going to take our nation back. That's just started in the last few days right after revival broke out. So nations are now beginning to feel the unrest of where they've been, and now they're beginning to feel the hope of where they want to go. Remember this, Mark Iran. Thirdly of all, earthquakes. Jesus told us about earthquakes. He said there'll be earthquakes in diverse places. We would have never known about that as a sign of his coming had he himself not told us out of his own mouth. He said earthquake. And just three weeks ago today, an earthquake hit Syria and Turkey that killed tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands of people. Earthquake. Euphrates River's drying up. Revivals broke out. Satanism is now on our television, on the Grammys. They're worshiping the devil right there in your living room, on television through CBS. Who would have ever dreamed that? <coughs> now you have artificial intelligence. Yes. It's major artificial intelligence. Now you have other signs, too numerous. I have, I have other things written down. There's too many signs to mention. And I just want to ask this question. Just listen to me. What's it going to take for you? What is it going to take? What else has to happen that I can add to this right here? Do I need to come back in here three weeks from now and add two more signs and then you'll believe? Is that what it's going to take? This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine signs I just listed off the top of my head, but I could have listed 15. How many more is it going to take until you say, oh my God, I believe Jesus is about to come. So I don't believe this revival is going to last long. I believe it's going to be a quick harvest. And I believe it's going to jump from this shores of America to the nations of the earth. I believe whatever God's going to do, he's going to do it quickly. And I'd say, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Ha, ha, ha. Let's stand up and praise him together. He just sing a song. Woo, woo. Ha, 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 ha. Look at look at here. If you know of somebody that you are on the outs with, how much longer are you gonna carry that? I mean, listen to me, how much longer are you gonna carry that? You gonna carry it five more days, five more months, five more years? You gonna carry it the rest of your life? You know, it looks like nothing's going to happen unless you take the initiative and go and say, let's get this thing under the blood. You've got to do that to be ready for heaven. You see, it's not so much getting right with God as it is getting right with other people too. Y'all listen to me? So what's it going to take for you to get right with other people and be ready for the coming of the Lord? So his coming is right at the door, and that's why I think revival is just going to be swift. It's going to be fast. It's going to be like a, a fast-burning forest fire. And it's going to sweep in a lot of people in the kingdom. Did y'all see Kelsey Grammer on TV the other day? Did y'all see him crying about how he was touched in the Jesus movement? He was crying on ABC, 
he was standing there crying and talking about how God had touched him. There's so many people that God wants to touch. There's so many things God wants to do. But here's one thing I want to say to you. I'm not sure that this revival is going to burn in many churches because many churches have already made their decision to block the Holy Spirit out. But I believe that this revival may go to the streets before it goes to some churches. And so whatever God's about to do, he's going to do it in the marketplace and he's going to do it in the streets. Just be ready. Amen. Looking for you For your return We don't belong here Heaven's our home Longing to see Your beautiful face Lord, can you hear us? Your bride, your redeemed Desire of the nation, King of the ages, come to your people. The bride has been waiting for your appearing, even so. So come on, man. We long to be right where you are. Come on, sing it with me. Jesus, our bridegroom, you have our heart. Yeah. So come take your bride. says we need to do this. He has fire in his eye and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse across this land. He has fire in his eyes, a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse all across this land. And he's calling out you and me, will you ride with me? Will you 
Give him praise. Hallelujah. 